what you're interested in learning more about today. We are always excited to welcome new researchers into the folds of the alternative protein scientific community. So very delighted that you're all here with us today. Today, I'm joined by two very brilliant scientists, Dr. Elliot Swartz of the Good Food Institute and Dr. Roni Rock of the Agriculture Research Organization in Israel to discuss the very rich and impactful opportunities for cell biologists to get involved in the alternative protein field. We are at a pretty critical juncture in the arc of our food system, and we view cell biologists as absolutely essential in this quest to preserve and to restore human, animal, and planetary health. So in just a couple of short moments, you'll learn a lot more from Elliot and Roni about the scientific case for alternative proteins, research opportunities in this emerging field, and resources we have to support your work. If you have any questions throughout, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A section and we'll make sure to address them. And then one last item before we get started is that um, I would love to invite you all to join the Alternative Protein Researcher Directory, which I will drop the link to in the chat shortly. GFI's Alt Protein Researcher Directory will allow you all to share your work on alternative proteins publicize the ways you hope to collaborate with other experts, labs, and companies, and identify potential partners to help you scale up the impact of your work. If you're compelled by what we share today about pathways for cell biologists in this field, um, join so that you can receive curated updates on research developments, funding opportunities, scientific events and forums, and collaborators that match your skills and interests. Um, alrighty, so without further ado, let's dive in. I'll pass the baton over to Dr. Elliot Swartz to get us started. Thanks for being here, Elliot. All right, thank you, Amy. And please shout at me if you can't hear me, but I'm assuming otherwise that I'm on. So welcome everyone, thanks for attending. My name's Elliot. I am a principal scientist uh, focused on cultivated meat technology at the Good Food Institute. And today I figured I'd be giving a, a bit of an overview about some of the interesting cell biology, cell line related aspects of cultivated meat. And hopefully that will spur um, you know, some thinking in your head about how you might be able to contribute to addressing some of the challenges in this interesting industry. So before I begin, I just wanted to share a little bit more about the Good Food Institute or GFI. We are an international network of nonprofits that are developing a roadmap for a more sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. And so we have uh, teams spread out across the world in the United States, Brazil, India, Israel, Europe, and the Asia Pacific region. And all of our programmatic work, uh, you know, happens under the same umbrella of trying to advance these alternative protein technologies in the marketplace and ensure their success. And so we're very critical in, in helping to ensure that there's really an innovation ecosystem in place um, that will drive these technologies forward um, so that they can have impact in the future. So the, the question that we're really interested in addressing is how are we going to feed a growing population? Um, one that is expected to near 10 billion people by the midpoint of this century. And the core challenge here is that the way that we produce meat today has numerous negative externalities associated with it. And so this is only expected to become more and more of an issue as meat consumption increases over time. And the UN predicts that meat consumption may increase anywhere between 50 to 100% by the midpoint of this century. So meanwhile, animal agriculture is already a top contributor to water use, air pollution, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, it accounts for around 15 to up to 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions, depending on how you account. Um, and it's responsible for about three quarters of the world's agricultural land use and about three quarters of the uh, human medically relevant antibiotics are given to animals rather than humans, such that it's a cause or driver of um, antimicrobial resistance. And then finally, another public health threat is zoonotic disease emergence. And so it's quite likely that, you know, the next pandemic could come from a, a, a farm that raises um, chickens or pigs, et cetera, as has happened in the past. And so all of these negative externalities we think can really be addressed through 
alternative proteins. And so our theory of change is that if you're able to develop the, these food products um, from different means that compete on price and taste with conventional animal meat, then you can win in the marketplace without having consumers to have to make a large behavioral shift. And so similar to what we're seeing with electric vehicles, where finally the price points are coming down to be more competitive and the performance is increasing such that consumers' needs are being met, um, you start to see inflection points in um, the adoption of these new technologies like electric vehicles. And so we think a similar trajectory can happen with alternative proteins. And we define alternative proteins by products that can be created from plants, uh, derived from fermentation processes, or cultivated from actual animal cells, which is what we'll be talking about today. So cultivated meat is real, genuine animal meat or seafood that can replicate the sensory and nutritional profiles of conventionally produced meat because it's really comprised of the same cell types that are arranged in the same or maybe similar three-dimensional structure as animal muscle tissue. And so you can see this, some early stage prototypes from a variety of different companies in the space, spanning seafood and other meat products. Um, and you might be aware that as of last week, there are two companies in the United States that received full clearance for uh, selling products to consumers. One of those was Upside Foods. And each of these products went under FDA evaluation for over a year, where FDA concluded that these are really no different from other animal cells with respect to safety for use in food. And so this was a, a pretty big hurdle for the industry to cross since it's really its inception around seven years ago, going from zero to now um, entering the marketplace for the first time in the United States. So at a high level, the, the production process starts by taking a sample of cells that can be obtained from the animal. And those cells are taken back to the lab uh, where they're subcultured and derived into cell lines that are workable uh, uh, for upscaling into a bioprocess or for end product development. And the, the goal here really in the first phase is to create a large am amount of cells. So you're proliferating cells in consecutively larger bioreactors to create the biomass that can either feed directly into these products as in individual ingredients or potentially move downstream into a process where they're differentiated, sometimes in the presence of a scaffolding structure for more structured products. Um, and eventually these cells or these tissues are harvested and then formed into a variety of different final products using methods um, and tools that are already uh, widely used in the food and or meat production industries. And so since this is an audience of cell biologists, I figured I'd focus mostly on the upstream portion of this because cells are really essential um, to this entire process. They are you know, the, the major primary input uh, from the beginning. And there's a lot of interesting questions and challenges that um, can be addressed through cell biology. So just to dive a little bit deeper into the cell line procurement stage here, um, typically what happens is a small biopsy is taken from a living animal, or in some cases, an animal that was recently slaughtered, and those cells or tissues are still viable. So, you know, as you can imagine, you're creating meat, so you might want to um, take uh, muscle tissue or a fat, fat tissue sample. In some cases, a fertilized egg is used, um, you know, a variety of different possibilities that we'll talk about in a few slides. Those tissues can be taken back to the lab, broken down and then sorted for the cell types of interest and eventually developed into a cell line that can propagate in culture. Or in some cases, some companies are actually using uh, sort of primary cells where they're rebiopsying from an animal repeatedly um, and growing those cells up in independent batches. But nevertheless, you wanna do some form of characterization for these cells to ensure that they're going to perform well in your process. So looking at things like growth rates, metabolism, different types of omics analyses are, are quite typical in the R&D process upstream in these companies and in labs. And then finally, these cells are banked in master and working cell banks that look quite similar to what you see in other animal cell biomanufacturing industries like biologics or vaccines. And so one of the interesting questions with cell line procurement is that really the, the health of the animal is an important downstream indicator of, of safety. And so one of the most important things you can do upstream from a quality control and quality assurance process is to ensure that you're obtaining cells from a healthy animal. 
And one of the other interesting questions that the industry, I think, is now starting to, to breach um, relates to, you know, whether this animal was living and slaughtered and what downstream implications does that have on certain religious certifications for the end product. So we actually um, surveyed around 40 different companies last year that responded um, ar around all these questions related to cell lines. And we published this report uh, just a few weeks ago. And so I'll share some of that data throughout the next couple of slides. But you can see that companies in the industry right now, about half of them acquire cells from recently slaughtered animals. Although I think the desire is to shift to uh, acquiring them from live animals so that slaughter isn't involved in the process. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to get your hands on, uh, you know, uh, biopsying tissues from living animals. It's easier to partner with a slaughterhouse or abattoir. However, this is also important for things like halal certification, where slaughter is uh, basically involved in the process from the get-go. And so many companies have a strong preference um, for these cell lines um, complying with halal certification, uh, especially dependent on where they sit regionally or geographically. So that's an interesting question that is being, I think, asked in the industry. Same thing with kosher. Um, certification, how does this work with respect to cell lines and other in media inputs? So you might be asking um, what cell lines or cell types do companies and researchers use in this field? And it's essentially any type that, of cell that can differentiate into the components of meat. And so, you know, you typically want to create muscle tissue, fat tissue, connective tissues, and there are a variety of different adult stem cells or even pluripotent stem cell types that companies are exploring for this use. And so you can see the breakdown here. There's really no um, majority for the selection of cell types that are being used in this industry. We really haven't seen any consolidation yet because there's just so many different approaches being taken, um, you know, and, and pros and cons of each, from, you know, starting from an adult stem cell versus an embryonic or pluripotent stem cell. Um, you know, so you get interesting pros and cons that break out and some people think that certain cells are advantageous versus, versus others. When you ask companies uh, what tissue types they're creating, it's perhaps unsurprising that most of them respond that they are interested in creating skeletal muscle, fat, and also fibroblasts or connective tissues. But you also do see a handful of companies exploring the use of endothelial cells or other vasculature, presumably probably to make more structured products, um, as well as other tissue types, whether it's cartilage, bone, other organs like cardiomyocytes or hepatocytes to create organ meats like foie gras. So one of the interesting uh, questions, you know, from an R&D perspective is, you know, what are the desired attributes that we want for a cultivated meat process, a cost-effective one? Um, and we ask companies, you know, sort of what sort of characteristics would you look for in a cell line? And you can see that companies are really interested in um, high proliferation rates with low doubling times. This is sort of self-explanatory to speed up your R&D process as well as have uh, cost implications, uh, especially at scale. You want genomic stability across multiple generations, important from a regulatory perspective and a reproducibility uh, point of view. Immortalization, which we'll talk about. Um, so cells that you know sort of divide indefinitely, usually easier to work with or bank over time. Um, one of the other interesting areas is that, you know, a lot of these cells like muscle cells or fibroblast cells are typically adherent. And so they need a surface to grow on. Uh, but this usually isn't, um, you know, compatible with how we think about scaling up animal cell cultures, which are typically done in suspension. And so transitioning these cell lines to uh, adapt them to suspension culture is often a, a challenge that many companies face early on. Um, similarly, differentiation, obviously important. Metabolic efficiency, I think, is actually underrated here. I would put it near the top of my priority list to think about from a cost and environmental impact perspective. Um, and then other uh, things that are related to the sort of process, especially when you get to scale, um, shear stress, as well as the buildup or limitation of metabolic byproducts like ammonia become increasingly important um, as you try to grow large quantities of cells. One of the other areas of interest are in, for R&D in this field is to eliminate the use of animal components in the media and throughout really the entire process aside from the cells themselves. And so serum-free media creation is really important and also 
it, you know, somewhat of a challenge because we have to create serum free media that span all these different species from crustaceans to fish uh, to avian species like chicken. Um, and a lot of that hasn't really been done before. And so a lot of this is all, all new in terms of media optimization and culture conditions. But uh, nevertheless, you can see that a lot of companies have had success uh, developing serum-free media. Um, about half of these companies say that the performance is relatively equal to serum-containing media, while some say they have eclipsed the performance of serum-containing media. So that's a good sign. Um, while other earlier stage companies are most likely still in the development phase, of switching and or increasing the performance of their serum-free media. So another uh, area of interest is immortalization and engineering of cells. Um, different types of immortalization methodology can be selected. And so here you can see a breakdown of um, immortalization methods from spontaneous immortalization, which is the sort of uh, leading um, so method of, of choice for companies for R&D and commercial purposes, presumably because this sits outside of the boundaries of most uh, genetically modified regulatory pathways. You also have non-integrating expression, which sits about in the middle, and then permanent genome alteration, uh, which is the lowest uh, preferred method, presumably, again, due to this requiring a longer or more rigorous regulatory pathway. And if you ask companies about genetic engineering methods um, for R&D or commercial use, you can see that about half of companies don't even, uh, aren't even really thinking about using genetic engineering. So they're just doing sort of a GM free process. Others are looking into it for R&D and then others, a uh, smaller percent around 20% of companies are exploring this for commercial use as well. And in fact, one of the companies that was approved for sale in the United States last week, Upside Foods, does indeed use genetic engineering to uh, immortalize their fibroblast cell lines by overexpressing the chicken telomerase gene. So I think this opens the door for a lot of um, people exploring this uh, as an option, especially in the United States. So this is just a small snapshot of companies. Uh, you know, there's obviously, uh, there's now 100 uh, cultivated meat manufacturers around the world with another 50 to 100 companies that sort of play uh, a, a horizontal role in the value chain, you know, sort of specialist companies, some of which I've listed here just so you can get a sense of um, some of the type of work that goes on related to cell biology upstream. So there are a few companies like Roslyn Technologies and OPPO um, in New Zealand that are creating cell lines specifically for use in this industry. So to sell validated sort of characterized cell lines to researchers in academia and also for commercial use. You also have companies like Triple Bar Bio that uses microfluidics technologies to enhance cell line development. So thinking about, you know, can we speed up the time it takes to uh, create a suspension adapted cell line? Uh, this is something that a company like this can help with. Prolific Machines is a startup that's trying to engineer and grow cells entirely without growth factors. This is really important from a cost perspective. And then finally, you have, uh, you know, obviously the culture conditions are very dependent on the cell culture media that's being used. And so you see companies that are really interested in metabolic engineering, modeling, et cetera, to inform media development and to optimize the feed conversion ratios. So to ensure that, you know, the ingredients that are in the cell culture media are exactly what those cells need. And you want to limit waste because cost for this industry is really, really sensitive. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, um, you know, some of the activities and challenges or things that are going on in the cultivated meat industry. Maybe you can relate some of that to the own work that, that you're, you've done or, or that you're doing right now. And just wanted to share a little bit about my path um, and how I got here. So I, I majored in neuroscience as an undergrad and also have a, a PhD in neuroscience at UCLA, but I would actually consider myself more of a cell and molecular biologist. And so for my graduate studies, I worked uh, with human iPS cells to model neuromuscular disease, making skeletal muscle tissue that you can see here, sheet of skeletal muscle tissue contracting. Um, and then the, the sort of end goal of my product project was really to try to create a spinal cord in the dish. So you see an iPSC derived group of motor neurons that are attached to these uh, iPSC derived skeletal myotubes. And these cells are derived from ALS patients to try to get insights into how this neuromuscular disease might have happened. Um, and that now I'm a scientist at GFI where I've been for the past five years, but 
really what led me to transitioning my career path from something that's more applicable to, let's say, drug discovery or uh, therapeutics uh, for neurodegenerative disease, which was the focus of my research. Um, you know, I really came to grad school with the hope to go into regenerative medicine. But throughout my time there, I became more and more concerned and interested in addressing climate change, which I viewed as probably the, the biggest um, issue of my lifetime. I learned about cultivated meat back in 2015 or so when some of the first companies were being formed. Um, but back then there wasn't a lot of information. And so I actually wrote a blog post uh, online and a lot of people found that. I started getting cold calls from investors. People found it useful. Um, and so that really convinced me to, I think, you know, really start a kickstart a career in this field while it was still young so I could sort of grow with it. Um, I found out about GFI around that same time. It was, it was founded in about uh, 2016, 2017, our organization. Um, and then finally, when I joined GFI, I became vegetarian so I could sort of uh, completely walk the walk um, if I was going to be out here uh, telling everyone to reduce meat consumption and coming up with ways to, to solve this challenge. And so um, there's this term, ikigai, uh, in, in, in Japanese that sort of unites all these different things around uh, your passion, your profession, your vocation and, and mission, and, and being able to marry these uh, under one umbrella. And for me, I think that's sort of the cultivated meat field because it um, addresses really important things about what the world needs and what I care about from a mission perspective uh, with respect to animal welfare, climate change, uh, human health issues, uh, food insecurity. There's also really challenging scientific questions. Um, so this is certainly by no means easy to do this. And I think it's going to take a lot of time. Um, but obviously I can leverage sort of my training as a cell biologist to um, get into the field uh, from the beginning. And also you can get paid for it, obviously. So I, I have a job and hopefully you guys might consider a job as well in this industry. Um, there's more and more opportunities every day. So thank you for your attention. And I think I will pass it to Roni now. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking from Israel, so it's a uh, late evening now. And um, I want to say first, a uh, very thank you for uh, hosting me. And I want to say a lot of thanks for the GFI, also for organizing and uh, uh, and getting me into this event. And also for the huge support in my research. And uh, I'm a new uh, researcher at the Volcani Institute, the Agriculture Research Organization uh, in Israel. And my lab is working on cultured meat. So this is uh, the first lab in Israel that studied cultured meats, and this is the um, this is the whole purpose of uh, my lab. Um, I want to tell you a bit about my academic journey because it wasn't trivial, and it was very surprising for me to get to the cultured meat uh, field. So I I did my uh, PhD uh, in Tel Aviv University where I studied. And uh, I studied cancer and designed novel uh, drug inhibitor for uh, uh, cancer. Um, the first postdoc I did on a very, very different subject was linking tRNA expression to longevity, uh, studying it on uh, C. elegans in uh, uh, Odette Lechavi's lab. Uh, and my second postdoc was uh, was dealt with uh, also uh, translation and tRNA expression, but here I a bit combined the previous two uh, um, the, the previous two uh, uh, research uh, and studied how tRNA expression and uh, protein translation affect proliferation and differentiation and how it changes between a uh, cell that proliferate and cells which differentiate, which are the two uh, different aspects of uh, cell uh, life. Um, after uh, the second uh, postdoc position, I applied for a position in the Volcano Institute, which, uh, which was designated for studying cultured meat. I thought that I might be able to combine all the uh, knowledge and all the expertise in the research I gained and 
study cultural needs. I have to say here again, thank you to GFI that uh, I consulted with them a lot about how my future lab can look like and what are the hot topics in the cultural meat uh, area right now. Um, so I talked with the GFI and I thought, how can we feed the world? So it's not very easy yet. So we're not here yet uh, in just thinking about food and making it just magically appearing on our plate. There is still a lot of work to do. Uh, and I thought there might be a lot of uh, research opportunity in this area. Um, I will skip on what is cultured meat because I will have presented it very nicely uh, and go to my passion and how I see research combining in this uh, aspect. So during millions of, billion of years, uh, cells evolved to become from unicellular organism to multicellular organism. It took two billion years to get from a unicellular organism to a multicellular organism. I thought that the cultured meat area might present the opposite. So taking multicellular organism and adapt it to grow independently and become something like a, a unicellular organism and have the challenges of growing alone in a rich environment. So when we gain the multicellularity, uh, there's a lot of uh, profit in that. So there is cell uh, specialization. We can acquire a lot of new uh, traits, uh, such as uh, better immunity, uh, muscle, so we can be stronger, uh, we can uh, digest much more, we can uh, move between environments and sense the environment. We can also get to a higher size, uh, and higher diversity in uh, the organism type. However, unicellularity has its own benefits. So one cell can, can be self-contained. Uh, it can have all the traits he needs, all the, um, uh, it can fulfill all his needs and sense the environment. It has much fast reproduction rates. So it actually, can adapt better and uh, colonize, colonize uh, better uh, environment. Uh, also, it demands less researchers, uh, resources. So to, to create better uh, cultured meat, we have to uh, get back the unicellular uh, properties um, we actually lost in the uh, evolution. In addition, a uh, multicellularity, a uh, multicellular organism carry a lot of uh, a huge genome, uh, a lot of uh, other genes that are not relevant anymore for the culture of meat production. So um, in multicellular organism, there is dichotomy between cellular proliferation and cellular differentiation. The cells can actually, um, when they proliferate, they have a lot of cell autonomous function, and most of the proteins that are expressed are a uh, protein related to cell cycle, to translation, to transcription, and um, cell uh, autonomous function. However, when they differentiate, they express they express a different uh, a set of genes. Uh, the genes are more related to tissue specific and cell communication, um, and different panel for each uh, type of cell. Um, when we want to move between those axes, we have actually, um, if we go to the proliferating cell, we have all kinds of stem cells, uh, induced uh, pluripotent cells, or cancer, uh, if it goes wrong. Um, and when we talk about which is the good uh, cell source for culture meat, as Elliot already presented, uh, there might be a very different uh, source uh, for cultured meat. However, there is a trade-off between proliferation and differentiation. So cells that proliferate well might be very hard to differentiate, while cells that are more differentiated, they also proliferate a bit less. Um, so 
My lab is actually studying the genetic regulation of proliferation and differentiation. We chose to work on mesenchymal stem cells, which are a bit in the, in the middle of this trade-off. So they do proliferate and they can also differentiate, but there is still a lot of way to improve both the, the proliferation and the differentiation. So we are working on adipose-derived bovine mesenchymal stem cell animal, uh, either alive and by biopsy without hurting the animal too much, or uh, from a slaughtered animal. Uh, it's interesting. I was uh, discussing uh, people from uh, uh, the religion uh, uh, rabbis in uh, Israel when they actually much prefer taking it from a slaughtered animal, a kosher slaughtered animal. Um, I actually think it's not good to slaughter an animal for that, but uh, it's still debatable. Um, so the cells we're actually producing uh, are mesenchymal stem cells. They have a fibroblast-like uh, phenotype, uh, and we can uh, identify them by a lot of uh, uh, characterized uh, surface marker uh, identified by fax. Um, we can also isolate and cryobank those cells, and they maintain their proliferation and differentiation in culture. Um, so, at the first, we isolated the, uh, the cells from a uh, bovine uh, adipose tissue. Um, oh, sorry, I just jumped. Um, we measured their growth rate, and we wanted to make sure they are stable to work many, many passages uh, in culture, and we can see that they maintain their doubling time uh, of about 36 to 40 hours uh, throughout the passages. Uh, and we also uh, identified surface markers by fax. Um, most important is that the cells can differentiate into a uh, desired tissue uh, and to, uh, to check their uh, their uh, uh, multipotent uh, potential, we can actually differentiate them both to uh, adipose uh, tissue and also to uh, chondrogenic uh, uh, tissues. Um, so how can we look at the trade-off and how can we optimize the proliferation and differentiation of those cells? So my lab is actually focused on this area of gen how can uh, we can uh, adapt them genetically. Uh, our genetic adaptation is actually a tool to study both what can we do genetically, but also to identify other small molecules or inhibitors that can affect uh, uh, the process and optimize the proliferation and differentiation rate. Um, how do we do that. Uh, we want to see how the evolution actually change uh, and shape the destiny of the cells as we talk about multicellularity and unicellularity. And we want to uh, apply the evolution uh, forces of, uh, to study those uh, aspects. Um, we, we started first in looking at natural variation and see whether different type of animal can contribute uh, to the phenotype of fast growing, fast proliferation, and uh, efficient differentiation. Um, so, and this project is actually funded by uh, GFI in Israel. Um, the other way for us to study uh, this aspect are using genetic editing uh, variation. So for this purpose, we created a whole genome library of CRISPR knockouts. Uh, and introduce them to, uh, the, mes to, mes to the mesenchymal uh, stem cells. Um, I will expand more about this project, which is funded by uh, GFI uh, worldwide uh, in the initiate. All right, it looks like Roni's internet hey, may have cut out. Hey, Roni. Hi. Um, we are experiencing just intermittent Wi Fi blips, I think, okay. on your end. So you just froze for about 30 seconds, but it's possible oh. if you turn off your camera 
it might work a little bit better and we'll get a steady oh. stream of audio. Yeah, okay. So I'm stopping the video. Do you hear me better now? Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Rooney. So I'm starting from this slide again. Um, okay. So to study the genetic basic of proliferation and differentiation, we wanted to apply the evolution forces on those cells uh, and to study how the evolution actually might affect those processes. Um, so first we used natural variation uh, of animals. So we can use different type of bovine, uh, bovine that was selected to be uh, efficient in meat production or in uh, milk yield. So they have different uh, uh, natural, natural variation and we can see how those natural variation affect proliferation and differentiation of the mesenchymal stem cells. Um, this project is funded by the GFI Israel. Uh, the second project, um, is using a genetically editing var variation. So we use a CRISPR, uh, we design and apply a whole genome CRISPR screen that targets each of the uh, genes in bovine. Um, and we can use uh, artificial selection uh, to mimic evolution forces to select for phenotype that are more adjusted to the uh, cultured meat uh, industry. And this project is funded by, uh, was funded by the GFI uh, uh, initiation uh, grant program. Um, so using those two uh, approaches of natural variation and genetic editing variation, we can uh, measure how the genetic changes affect uh, growth and environmental growth condition and how it can actually adapt to uh, less use of growth factor, a different uh, type of scaffolding and um, um, and uh, all other processes uh, related to culture being projected. So uh, I want to expand a bit more about the CRISPR and knockout uh, uh, genetic uh, variation. So we identify how can we uh, select for uh, genes that uh, might affect the proliferation rate or differentiation rate. We analyzed uh, the DEFMEP uh, database, which have CRISPR screen uh, data of over a thousand cell types. Um, and we can identify uh, which genes are actually has the best effect on cell growth. So each gene gets a score based on how uh, it affected the, uh, the growth of all of each individual cell type. And we can see that uh, the different genes get the highest score. It means that when they are knocked out, the cells that had this knockout actually proliferate much better. Um, we selected a specific uh, a gene for a group of concept. We uh, focused on the P10 gene. Yeah. Okay, and when we knocked out uh, P10 in a bovine mesenchymal cell, we actually saw an increase of 20% in growth rate. 20% uh, is maybe sound a bit uh, not a lot, but when we uh, calculate a uh, cell growing to 30 days, uh, we can see that the number of double change from 23 to 29 cent cell double, doubling. And uh, when we calculate the weight arising from this uh, cell growth, uh, we can see that we increase the number from 10 kilogram to 600 kilogram, just by increasing the uh, cell growth by 20%. Uh, and next we employ, we apply the whole genome CRISPR uh, screen to identify more candidates and to uh, actually characterize the genetic uh, background of the cells and to see which genetic pathway can influence uh, those cells. Um, again. Okay. Um, so the first step was to uh, generate a CRISPR uh, 
uh, Cas9 uh, expressing uh, cells. And we were able to do that in uh, bovine residual stem cells. It wasn't very easy to uh, calibrate the viral uh, um, the viral transfection of the cells, but we were able to do that um, eventually. Um, and then we did appropriate selection pressure. So we can use the whole genome CRISPR library to study many uh, different effects and to characterize uh, which genetic uh, pathway and uh, genetic regulation affects uh, the growth uh, of the proliferation rate, uh, the differentiation potential, and also studying the um, condition, for example, growth in suspension. Um, first, we started with uh, proliferation rate, and we can see that once we introduce genetic modification to each cells, we can actually select the cells and identify which cell contribute to their rapid proliferation. Um, so we did an experiment and followed the cells in and sampled them in individual days. So for example, day one, day 10, day 20, and day 30. And we can identify using next generation sequencing which uh, genetic modification contributed the most for the proliferation rate. Um, when analyzing the data, we can see that several genes uh, increase in their uh, uh, abundance in the population uh, during time. For example, uh, this gene, which is not a new gene, it's P53, and um, also P10 increased uh, in the population, uh, showing that knockout of this gene actually contribute to cell proliferation rate. Um, in addition, when uh, looking at the uh, library of uh, the genetic modif uh, modification, we can see that over time, the proliferation rate uh, increases and the doubling uh, time de decreases. Uh, and also, just looking at the population, we can see that there is a, a, an increase in a, a cell adaptation to uh, the media. Um, I will stop here. Uh, so this is my lab. I want to say thank you to all my students and thank you all so much for uh, hosting me. I hope the internet didn't fall too much. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Roni Rock for a fabulous mm -hmm. presentation and also to Dr. Elliot Swartz for your presentation as well. Um, all of you in the audience, if you haven't had the chance to do this already, please do add any questions that you have for our speakers today in the Q&A section of your Zoom bar, and we will get to them shortly. In the meantime, I have a few calls to action for those of you who are interested in cultivated meat, interested in continuing to explore your career as a researcher in this field. Um, the first is to join us at gfi.org slash researchers and join the alternative protein researcher directory. Again, this global researcher directory will allow you to share your research, publicize ways you hope to collaborate with other experts, labs, or companies, and identify other collaborators and potential partners to help you scale your work. Um, you'll also receive a bi-monthly newsletter. Um, thank you. Next slide. Um, we also invite all of you to explore key research opportunities at gfi.org slash solutions. So as is abundantly clear um, from hearing about some of Roni's research and, and about some of the opportunities that Elliot outlined, there are so many opportunities and unanswered questions when it comes to cultivated meat science that we need your brains for. So um, if you are interested in, in, in kind of exploring a high impact career, um, curious about what research bottlenecks exist, this is the right place to go for you. And then lastly, I also invite all of you um, to generally check out um, the, on the next slide, um, the many open access resources we have for researchers at gfi.org slash science, including the alternative protein literature library, our state of the industry reports. We have a research grants program um, with our RFP launching very soon, um, later next month, and some deep dives into the science of plant-based cultivated meat and, and fermentation. 
Um, so again, those of you who have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A section of our chat here, um, and we will get to them shortly. Um, but thank you all for your participation. Alrighty, so I do see here a question from one of the members of the audience um, wondering, I think this is a question for Elliot, if you can speak a little bit more about the use of IPSCs for cultivated meat and maybe focus particularly on the regulatory landscape and any hurdles you might anticipate. Sure. Yeah. So it's an interesting question that, and one that has um, come up uh, quite a bit for people that are, uh, you know, familiar with pluripotent stem cells. So I'd say, as you saw in the the survey data, there are companies that are using IPSCs, and you know, as as Roni discussed, the advantage here is that you know they proliferate quite quickly. Um, you know, generally culture conditions are are defined, although they have to be tweaked. Um, you know, depending on the species that you might be working with. You know, we've never really generated IPSCs from a variety of different like crustaceans or sea seafood related cell lines, for instance. So that's an interesting challenge that some researchers are having. Um, uh, but you know, the challenge is getting them to differentiate into the, the cell types that you want. And so a lot of companies, in addition to, you know, the, how it, how it relates to regulatory is, um, it, twofold. So one is in the actual method of, of generating the pluripotent stem cells. So, um, this is not like an easy, you know, black and white answer. I think it really depends on where you are in the world. So for instance, uh, Europe um, might classify like even the use of, let's say, an mRNA to transduce to, to, to transform your cells um, would qualify as, as a genetically modified thing. So any any sort of like nucleic acid that enters the cell might trigger um, GMO regulation in Europe. Um, but that's not how we understand it to occur in, in the United States and in some other places in the world. So you can use things like Sendai virus or other, you know, non-integrating viruses or methodologies um, to generate your IPSC. So that's generally the approach that companies will, will take. And then from a differentiation standpoint, you see a lot of um, engineering there as well. So, you know, overexpression of myOD or some other uh, master regulator for those cell types of interest, whether it's fat or muscle, those can really control the, um, you know, the, the differentiation process into what you want to do. But of course, then you're using, a, you know, in most cases, a, a, a genetically engineered construct within um, those cells. So it's it's a challenge from a regulatory perspective. Thanks, Elliot. Um, I My next question for um, Elliot and Roni both, and this is kind of admittedly a big question, is, um, you know, it's, it's very clear that we're at this exciting time to be entering the alternative protein field because there seem to be dozens of opportunities cropping up on the daily, um, but it's also maybe a lightly nerve wracking time to be exploring careers in this field because um, cultivated meat and alternative proteins center on emerging technologies that don't have well-defined career pathways um, like there are for more conventional and well-understood paths like biopharma. So um, I'd love to get your perspective, Elliot and Roni, on what you think of as the major um, um, education and training dimensions that helped prepare you from where you are today, so that those of, of us in the audience that are, um, you know, there isn't a cultivated meat major that they might take, um, but what would you say are the foundational kind of skills and experiences someone should try and amass, um, maybe in a more informal capacity or in a formal educational environment to prepare themselves for this sector. Hi. So again. Yeah, Verne, do you want to start us off? Oh, my internet is so unstable. I'm so sorry. Do you hear me? Yes. You okay, sound great. Good. Um, so I wanted to say first that from a scientific point of view, the cultured meat is very unexplored and it's fascinating. I actually, the thing that attracted me most to the cultured meat area was looking at it as kind of new organism that emerged to the world. And I think it's a new organism that is going to feed the entire world population in my perspective. And it's not researched enough. So there's so many opportunity how to 
use the cultural myth as a research uh, tool and to study what is going on with this new organism. So this is what actually attracted me as a scientist to the cultural myth area. Of course, that since it's not yet very uh, um, advanced, so we, we also need to contribute it to become the world uh, fitting uh, opportunity. So that's that's my point of view for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say one thing I didn't mention is that I, I'd say, you know, cultivated meat is like one of the most interdisciplinary fields that I, I can actually imagine. Um, you know, you have upstream, you have cell biology, um, you have people that are, you know, working in uh, chemistry and biochemistry related to uh, media inputs. You have engineers that bioprocess engineers, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers coming together to help scale the process up. You have food scientists, um, you know, coming in at the at the end stage, and you have a blend of of all of this sort of dis different disciplines coming together, and you really need success in all of these areas to meet the the cost requirements um, that we're going to need to commercialize these products. And on top of that, you are intersecting and getting more, you know, in tune with um, you know environmental sciences or how these how these issues intersect all these other um, global challenges, and so. I think with that said, as, as Amy mentioned, there's, you know, few programs, although we expect and, and hope to see more programs that are specifically tailored to uh, education for um, cellular agriculture or cultivated meat. Um, but really, no matter what you did, I mean, I think if you're an engineer, if you're a scientist, um, and even if you're outside of those disciplines, you can find a, a, a role in, in this field or in other alternative protein fields. Um, you know, policy work is, 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 is um, you know, interesting, too. And a lot of the scientists that do science by pol policy can find a home um, here as well. So, I mean, yeah, I'd say that opportunities are boundless and it's exciting to get into something that's new um, so that you can really grow and, and carve out your own expertise and role within the, the field before it becomes uh, too much of a... A, a web, I'd say. <laughs> Thank you both. Yeah, I appreciate you speaking to um, the reason someone should choose a career path like this one that's relatively uncharted compared to other more conventionally and well understood paths. Um, I think there's a really compelling case there to be um, part of um, this massive paradigm shift towards a better food system. Um, I know as a lot of folks consider the, their career paths, career security is a big dimension that, that often comes up. Um, so kind of along the same vein, I would love to, to hear um, from Elliot and Roni, what are some of the signals you've been seeing that this might be part of a durable technological or paradigm shift with real disruptive power and not just another technology that overpromises or like comes and goes um, and, and thus not, not um, uh, not something that somebody might want to focus a, their long-term career trajectory on. Well, I, I can I can start by just saying that you know I've I've been at GFI for five years, and so I've I've witnessed some of the the growth within this industry sort of firsthand. And I think one of the exciting things is that, which I alluded to, but you have all these different companies that are not cultivated meat manufacturers, but they, um, you know, they might be other life science companies doing things in cellular therapeutics or regenerative medicine, other aspects of biomedical research or, or even other uh, other fields. And, you know, part of that business model is now being inclusive of, of cultivated meat. And similarly, you, you, so you have smaller startups that are, that are doing that, that are sort of plugging in to this sort of specialist role within the value chain to build this industry. But you also see very large corporations, multinationals, et cetera, that employ, you know, thousands and thousands of, of people um, carving out divisions within their um, their entities to address, you know, alternative proteins or cultivated meat as well. So I think what, you know, when you start to see all of that sort of thing, those, those sorts of things come together, as well as increased public funding um, being being more and more available, I think that is all good signs that this is going to to last and we're just really at the, the beginning phases. Yeah, I, I agree. And also, um, we, we can see so many companies in Israel and so many opportunities. And each new development gives, a, gives rise to a whole new industry. So, for example, uh, when you uh, identify uh, 
a small challenge so many companies can rise and 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 answer those new challenges and i think this is very unexplored territory and can give rise to so many more advances and also influences the industry of uh, uh, medical and uh, pharma give back the feedback to that Definitely. Certainly many adjacencies, both feeding into and spawning off of the cultivated meat field. Um, all right. Last question to our speakers before we wrap up today. Um, would love to just get a sense of whether you have any overarching career advice for cell biologists who are out there feeling maybe a little bit daunted about an entryway point into the cultivated meat space. Is there anything else that you have not said, um, a core piece of career advice that you'd like to impart on our audience? I would uh, advise them to talk with uh, you guys <laughs> and see the opportunities uh, you're opening. And uh, I know that uh, GFI was very, very supportive uh, in my uh, transition to the culture of uh, uh, industry. So I want to say thanks and just be open to that. I, I don't know. From my perspective, I think, um, you know, a lot of people think about job security or, or, or money or, or something like that when they're thinking about career selection or pathways, whether it's academia or industry, you know, you're in grad school and you're trying to figure that out. But I don't I don't think enough people think about like what what's going to provide them really the most joy in their in their work. And so if you can align your your passion, like what you care about um, with what you actually do for work, you're going to be much happier no matter where you land up. And so I think with cultivated meat, it intersects all these different um, things that a lot of people care about. So hopefully you can um, identify with one of those and align your career um, to address that. And I, I think you'll end up um, being quite happy with that decision. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elliot and Roni. Thank you so much to Sharissa and the American Society for Cell Biology. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, like Roni said, if you have curiosities, questions, um, and and um, things that you'd like to, to discuss with, that, with us, please do check out our resources at gfi.org. And don't hesitate to reach out if we can be helpful in helping explore your pathway into the cultivated meat field. Thanks again for joining us today and hope to be in touch soon. Thanks everybody, bye.